Hi, my name is Rod Cleef, and I'm the host of the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. And every week I interview multifamily rock stars, and we talk about how they've built incredible wealth for themselves and their families through multifamily properties. So hit the like and subscribe buttons to get notified every Monday when a new episode comes out. Let's get to it. Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled you're here. And I know you're going to get incredible information from the gentleman we're interviewing today. His name is Eng Tang, and Eng has got about $100 million in assets under management, um, but uh, he's, in, uh, he's in other asset classes than what we're normally talking about, and so I'm really excited, which is senior housing, which I'm really excited to dig into with him. Um, and, uh, and I think he's got an interesting story. So welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me, Rod. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So could you, could you give us a little bit of a background? Cause I know you worked at Apple and you've got, you know, quite a bit of background here. Um, you're an economist. So if you could just talk about, um, that and how you ended up getting into real estate. Yeah. Uh, so I'm probably a classic immigrant story, maybe a little bit more uh, different than others, but I was born in a refugee camp in Thailand. Mm -hmm. My parents are Cambodian, uh, escaped to Khmer Rouge, um, came wow. here when I was three years old. Uh, I had some really crazy stories of, you know, people. Wow, being I, rem I remember about reading about the Khmer Rouge and, the, yeah. and, and the atrocities and the genocide and all of that. I knew you were, I've assumed you were Vietnamese from the name, but I, I, I a Cambodian, forgive me if that's an insult, what I just said, I don't know the <laughs> culture well enough to know, but, but anyway, uh, wow, the Khmer Rouge. Yeah. I mean, uh, there was a, I was trying to think of that movie that, uh, Killing Fields. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thing. Anyway, I'm sorry I interrupted. Please continue. Forgive me. No, it's okay. I, I, I love having a conversation about this. It's yeah. really my parents' story, but in for, it really formed who I am. And, you know, growing up in LA, uh, California, I grew up on welfare, poor. My parents didn't have any education. My mom told me of her stories of carrying buckets of water uh, miles uh, in, her, in her village. Um, but they were hustlers. And they kept hustling and working long hours. Um, and so it really instilled me an entrepreneurial spirit that for me, my overall driving why was lifting my parents, my family out of poverty. I had three siblings. I was really good at math. I was really good at um, data patterns and eventually got into day trading when I was 16. Hmm. Um, and this is before anybody had apps or smartphones. I had to literally go in between classes to go to the school library and log into my brokerage account, do some trades. Early 2000s, so almost wow. everyone was winning until they didn't. Um, but then went to Wharton, went to, uh, Ivanka was a senior when I was a freshman. Um, wow. cool. Yeah, <laughs> got into poker, so more data analysis and stats. <laughs> um, was a two-time champion at Wharton. Um, uh, and then got into um, more, you know, stock trading and day trading and got into investment banking after that. And I really didn't like that volatility. It was just so much, I because if you come from a poor background like me or with little means, every time you lose something, it's like, ah, that took forever to earn. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're yeah. working four or five jobs, you, everything you, but if you're not willing to bet on that, which is what it is, you know, stock investing is betting. Uh, playing poker is betting. Sure, you might have better informed pot odds or better informed data, um, but still, there's some element of risk um, with any investing. But it felt very risky, and I didn't like that feeling. Once the stock market crashed, it made sense to go into real estate. Like, oh, these prices are really good. There's some really great cash flow on this. I could buy this for 126, put 30 percent down at that time, and uh, it was cash flowing thousand dollars a month on a. $35,000 cost basis. It was great. Nice, nice, nice. And so, so you started in single family, I take it? Was that in LA or, or where, where did you start? I started in LA. I, was, yeah. um, I bought my first property when I was in, in DC. So I, mm -hmm. I started out of state investing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been doing it ever since. It was a triplex. And mm -hmm. I've, I have bought a few single families, but typically I've always bought triplex or quadplex to start what essentially my W2 could uh, help accelerate. Because mm -hmm. you know, when you 
getting a residential loan for units and above below. They care about what income you're making. They don't really care what the property income is. Right, right, right. Yeah. They, they qualify you. So, 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 um, you mean four units or above? Is that what, did I misunderstand you? Four units and below. That's what oh, below. That's, Correct. Yeah. It's about you. When you get higher than that, that's the property's ability to service that, that that's exactly. the biggest factor. Gotcha. Okay. And, and, um, and now you do syndications, you do larger chart, larger transactions. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so your asset base um, is, is I know you've got, what, what'd you say? Seven senior housing facilities? It's six and then six? one under contract. Oh, fantastic. Mm-hmm. And, and do, is, is that where that, those assets are based or do you also still have some multi, other multifamily I, I, that's lumped in there? I, I didn't get that. Yeah, I have 800 units of multifamily. 800. I fantastic. love multifamily. It makes a lot of sense. It's a very sellable asset. It's also very buyable, which means that the cap rates have compressed and it's getting a little bit too hot or yeah, like yeah. what I've been thinking for the last three years, but there's still good deals out there. It's just hard to find. So, so, so I'm going to, and guys, those of you listening, forgive me, I am going to spend some time on senior housing just because it's kind of a pet thing of mine. I've been threatening to do it for a decade. And back 10 years ago, I used to own the uh, domain name affordablesseniorhousing.com and I never did anything with it and I really planned to do it. So I'm going to spend a little time here. So forgive me if that doesn't interest you. Uh, but, but um, so, so your facilities, are they, are they residential assisted living or are they larger? Give me an idea of, of what it is that you have. They're almost always, they're all sort of around 100 units, around 80 to 120 unit uh, facilities. And they're um, typically newer facilities with a lot of amenities. Think of it like a all-inclusive resort for a senior. And it's targeting 85 plus, typically assisted living, memory care, potentially some skilled nursing in some facilities. But it's the facilities that are you know, for the seniors, they, the average tenure is around 28 months. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're income resistant because they don't have income. They're, they're using the retirement. They're using the last savings to have a really good end of life care, end of life uh, facility to live off. We do have independent living as well. That's typically a graduation. You have independent living, you graduate to assist it, you graduate right. to memory care, you graduate to skilled nursing. Right. And then, you know, right. And yes. Um, and so, so are you an operator or you just own the real estate? I am, I, I am an operator, but I an operator with really great people, executive directors and folks that really do most operations. Okay. When it that is a, you, that's yeah. a, that's a, that's a lot of, I mean, that's a business and then some, right. Mm-hmm. It's so many components to it, the medication, the food, the safety, the right. Yeah. It's almost all, when you think about, um, you know, multifamily, it's a business as well, but it's a very light touch business. If you set the process up right Correct. with seeing your living, it's very much about HR. There's so many staff you have to manage and you have mm-hmm. to make sure you efficiently do so. But the great thing is high operating business with, all the tax benefits of real estate. Mm. Great combination. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I've always been interested in it. And, and you know, but there, there's, a, of course, a lot of liability. You do not want to any, but you don't want to make the cover of the paper for for having an employee, you know, not do the right things with, with grandma, obviously, because, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of litigation, a lot of regulation, and rightfully so, uh, it should be. Um, and you hear some of these horror stories, but, uh, and and, you know, I hear that, you know, sometimes you're, you're not able to pay, the pay scale may not be really where it, it, ideal, an ideal pay scale. So, so sometimes you're dealing with people that, you know, that are, I don't know how to word this properly without p- pissing a bunch of people off. But I, I mean, it's really, you know, you can't pay to hire the best possible people. So you have to do a lot of training. I'm assuming you're continually training, you're validating, you're affirming yeah. these people and, and, and helping yeah. them grow and become more. Um, so, you know, d- did I articulate that properly? Yes, it's you, you got to give people a chance, but you got to yeah. move on from people as soon as you d- right. they don't meet the standards because the standards are what what the seniors expect and our t- residents expect. They want to be in a very comfortable position, and they're paying f- typically four to five times the average rent of what a multifamily in that area would would serve go for. 
and your expenses are, aren't four to five times more, which is where you get better yield and better profit margins, but you have to optimize for that. And I've seen other facilities and other people in this industry go bad because they have the costs creep up, their staff costs, their other costs. Those are costs that in multifamily aren't just there. And here, if you're a good business operator, you can control that. And so you've just got great partners in this business is what you're saying uh, that help you operationally because I'm surprised you would even have time to talk to me with that many facilities if you, you know, if it was all you. So, so um, are you building them or buying them? Both. Both. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. We're what markets are you in, if I may ask? Uh, a lot of our multifamily and one of our um, senior living is in Kansas City. Oh. Wow. Uh, and then I love Kansas City. It's great barbecue. Uh, are, then you talk, have- you talk, are you talking about the eastern half of the state or the western half? I uh, e- Eastern half Eastern. of Missouri. Like Nashville or Memphis? Huh? Nashville or Memphis? Which which side? Um, I, I think, are you talking about Kansas City or are you talking about... Mi- Did you, oh, I thought you said Tennessee. Tennessee, no, I said Kansas, sorry. Oh, Kansas City, forgive me. I misunderstood you. Oh my God. I, 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 thought, I, I, was, I was all over. I, was, like, I, I had a bad experience in Memphis. And so I, I was just going to, I thought you said Tennessee, forgive me, Kansas too. City. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right. Kansas a little City, snafu yeah. there. All right. So they're in Kansas City. Okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Now, that's um, a great market. That's a great, great market. market. Um, and then also we have a bunch of facilities in Florida, of course, with developing mm. facilities, um, opportunity zones. So. Okay. Great. Well, let's talk, let's talk about our, let's shift, shift gears then. Let's yeah. talk about opportunity zones. Cause I'm kind of a neophyte as it relates to opportunity zones. I just haven't had the bandwidth to really study. Um, talk, talk about what the advantages of our, of you, yeah taking, you know, utilizing an opportunity zone for this. Yeah. And, and, I, and I talk a lot about opportunity zones because my background is in tech. Um, and a lot of our investors are tech investors. And as you can imagine, they get a lot of stocks. They mm-hmm. get a lot. Of, they have a lot of Apple stocks. They have a lot of Google stocks. And those mm-hmm. are, have appreciated a lot. And normally when you sell stocks, the only thing that you can do with it is to pay tax. Um, maybe you have a DST. But, you know, with real estate, you can defer, defer, defer with tender exchange. Right. Opportunity zone, same concept. Take that, take that profit, interest, capital gains. So say, so $200,000 of Apple stock, your cost base is hundred. Take the $100,000, invest in an opportunity zone fund that starts at 10 year clock. And if you invest before end of uh, this year, you also get a 10% reduction. So when you pay in 2026, instead of paying that, say 20% long-term capital gains on your $100,000, you now pay... 18,000. So 10% less, you can invest a whole hundred K you're you compound and grow it and you get the cost base, you get depreciation, you get all the same thing as real estate, right? That's just a wrapper through always these app wrapper. Then after 10 years, you can get all future capital gains eliminated. So you don't have to do, have to do any tender exchange depreciation recapture, which is classified as long-term capital gains also gets eliminated. So potentially all the cash flow that you earn during that 10 year hold, which should be significant if it's an, if it's senior living, um, will also be eliminated. Usually it's deferred, but here it's completely eliminated. Hmm. Wow. In the opportunity zone. Interesting. Okay. And, and is that where you're, I assume that's where you're building then not actually buying your building yes. in those OZ zones. Okay. Wow. Okay. So, so, uh, wow, that's, that's fascinating. And, and so there's no, um, you know, like in, in real estate, um, you know, there's that component that relates to um, being an active investor versus a passive investor as far as from the tax side. So that doesn't come into play with stock like that. No. no. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Well, so, so um, I know you worked at Apple uh, for a while, but first of all, what did you do there? Cause that's just such a cool company. I mean, I mean, what, what a, what an incredible brand following they've created. It's just such an impressive success story. What did you do there? And then how did that experience help you in what you're doing now? Yeah. uh, My last job there was a senior, uh, a data scientist at Siri. So Mm -hmm. I I analyzed billions of records. If you said anything to Siri, I probably probably didn't look at it directly, but uh, I analyzed it and I helped make Siri smarter. If it's not as smart as it is, uh, I'm sorry. It's not my fault. It's pretty freaking smart. I mean, she, yeah. she messes up once in a while, but I'm pretty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting because you get 
understand every dialect and every you know, it's oh, two sure. people talking is very interesting. Um, but it's all about data patterns. And what I did was a lot was also pitching stories to our executives around new features we're trying to develop. Because mm -hmm. I take the data, I say, hey, I see a lot of usage in this space. Can we create a function that allows you to use your iPhone to control your uh, uh, Apple TV and use it as a all-inclusive theater? Right. Uh, because people are asking that, it doesn't do anything now because it doesn't, but we have the data to show that. Hmm. Okay. So you would make presentations to the big shots there. Is that correct? Like yeah, Tim and Kirk and a few other folks. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. So, so how did that presentation experience help you in your communication with investors for the things that you do now? I think it, it was one of the most important things I've learned. Um, and one of the things I never thought would be that useful outside corporate America, <laughs> making decks all day. If you're in corporate America, you probably do that a lot. Um, right. But the point is, like, it's about telling a story of a why, when, and how. Hmm. Why are we doing this? Why should you do this? Why should you invest in this? How are we doing this? How what features should we build? How are we creating the value? And and how, so why should you trust us? How you should you trust us? Right. Um, and so I, I, I find it one of the most fascinating things in my transition from Apple to Tozy Capital to really think about creating very informative, but also simple means of explanation. So what Apple does really well is focus on simplicity and mm -hmm. delighting and surprising the customer. We always talked about that when I was working at Apple Music or Siri, it's like, how can you make things simple? It should be just obvious and intuitive. And so when I think about our investments with Tozy Capital, I always think about how can I make it simple? How can I make it be relatable to a person who potentially hasn't done this before, or it, you know, have experience with a 401k or, or a single family house? How can I make it relatable and simple? It shouldn't, I shouldn't have to go to a 50 page pitch deck to talk about all the highlights of the, of the, um, Investment. Uh, investment, right? It should make sense in the first five pages. Mm. Mm. No, that's that's really smart. So, yeah, I mean, when you're presenting to a, uh, you know, a, one of the biggest companies in the world, CEO, you better get to the point very, very quickly, right? And so, and 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 that's yeah, that's that's great framework, and uh, I love it. And and so, you know, let me ask you a question that. I, I know I, I know where you're going to go with this, but I want to ask the question so my listeners hear it. What do you think is one of the key reasons that people are successful? I think people who are adaptable and flexible to change yeah. um, are, at least from my experience, really successful. I have had many jobs. I have many careers. I have been in many asset classes. I have experienced many financial economic situations and the ability to be adaptable and ch flexible. And I'm not saying you should ch change your mind all the time. I'm saying you should be able to roll with the punches, be resilient, mm -hmm. change when things don't make sense, give it a shot, be persistent, but also know when you should change course. Give me, give me, give me a, 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 one of the most profound examples in your life when you had to be adaptable and or innovate or pivot, you know, uh, I, I, I'm thinking of mine where I, you know, we were supposed to have 800 people at a live event last May and we all know what happened with that. So I had to go online and pivot and innovate and be and adapt very, very quickly. Give me an example from your background, the largest one you can think of where you had to pivot and then adapt. You're talking about real estate or life? And whatever, or oh, oh yeah, the real estate would be preferred, yes. Uh, the biggest change has been realizing that all my California assets don't make sense and having to pivot. It could have just been easy because I was living close by. I could have just kept buying. I had all the connections. It was making decent cash and cash relative to my peers buying in California. I was doing better than them, but I could have just kept doing that and probably been satisfied with the growth and appreciation that California does give. But then I would have been frustrated with the rent control laws and the eviction laws and the other stuff that makes it hard to be a landlord. Um, and so I made the effort to go to Kansas City to make connections there, to find partners and experts in other markets and partner with them and pivot from being 
this person who just buy this thing every other year, every year to then growing bigger and thinking bigger and relying on more people and partnering with more people and, and getting outside my comfort zone. Nice. Nice. Um, did you have any mentors, uh, as you were growing, uh, you know, in, uh, like in, in the senior housing space, for example, uh, how, how did that come about? Did you meet someone that does it or just give us a little background on that? Yeah, I had a few mentors. Um, Doug, for example, he used to be a, a CEO of a really large uh, senior living facility. Um, I have partners who used to be CEOs of these other REITs and facilities. Um, mm. These guys have a lot of experience in this industry. And what I really like is that everybody, and you probably have experience, wants to be helpful. And when they're and when they've accomplished a lot, they want to give back. Mm. Um, I, I find myself always wanting to potentially mentor people if, if I ask um, myself and I don't have as much experience as these guys. I have a lot of good success and fortune, but I really do enjoy that. And I really appreciate when folks in this industry are very generous and giving with the time. Well, I will, I will tell you, you know, it's interesting. When I interview people for my warrior mentorship program and I ask them what their why is, And I hear that they want to do something outside of themselves. They want to help in some way, make the world better, help, you know, in any, anytime I hear something outside of themselves, I know success is inevitable because that's just the way the world works. And that's why those people you were describing are successful to begin with, because they have that mindset and recognize that we're all on this earth to contribute and help each other. So let me ask you this, um, Ng, what, what would you say to my listeners that are aspiring commercial real estate investors. They want to get into multifamily. They haven't taken the plunge yet. They haven't taken action. What words of wisdom would you give them, my friend? I would say just do it. And, and, and it, that's such a weird thing to say. It's hard, what, what do you mean just do it? Just do it. Uh, I would say if you want to get into commercial real estate, even if you don't have the means to do it, just go attempt it, find a market, find, find a couple of buildings and make an offer, do that. Maybe not, at least you made some reps. You've right. learned a little bit more. Create a pitch deck, mm-hmm. create a pitch deck for everything. Create an Excel pro forma and underwrite it and pitch it to yourself. Is this a good investment? If you can't convince yourself it's a good investment with numbers right. and math, and you're relying on the fact that there's a Starbucks and there's a Chipotle and the SKUs of five, a nine or something, like what does that matter? If it doesn't ma- mean that this is going to be a very nice yielding asset and it's all about returns really at the end of the day, those factors drive that, then you, if you can't convince yourself, you can't convince investors, you can't convince the bank, which is the biggest investor and all the other folks involved. Oh, good, good advice. Good advice. So but, but on the, on the thing of advice, what's the best advice you think you've ever gotten about real estate? Uh, I think the best advice has been to partner with people. Um, I think if you can't think, if, if you think that this is the only deal you ever do, if this is the only thing you ever do, and you, and this isn't the first of many, then you might be less generous. You might be less open to partnerships. You might be wanting to do it all. Like I don't want to hire a property manager because I want to keep that earnings because my time is, you know, I want to just drill my time into it. If you think of it like this is the first iPhone I'm building and it's expensive, the prototype, but the millionth iPhone is going to be cheaper. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for a million times. Then you're going to think, how can I scale? How can I grow with people and partners and experts? Yeah. Yeah. Partners is how you do it. And this guy's, this business is a team sport on that note, since he brought up partners, I've got a book that, that has all the important questions you should ask before you get into partnership. So if you guys want it, it's free because partnerships like a marriage are easy to get into, but they're hard to get out of. And if you want that book, just text the word partnership to seven, two, three, four, five, and I'll send it to you because, you know, I've had some you know, in my, in my multifamily boardroom mastermind, I've had some large operators, thousands of doors, split up partnerships um, uh, because, the, you know, they didn't ask those hard questions up front. So let me ask you this, uh, Ng, what inspires you? What's your why? I think I know the answer because I can see the wall behind you there, but I'm just curious <laughs> what, what your answer is. I, I, I just had another son. He's three years old. Oh, that's uh, cool. No, sorry, he's three months old. I have wow. another son who's three or almost three. And the, that's definitely my why. It's yeah. always been family. And when I haven't had that as my why, I've been kind of aimless. Mm. My first was my 
my family was, we were poor and I was the fortunate one to go to a good Ivy League school and really smart. And, and, I was, and all that time was pushing to, to help them overcome. But as soon as they became okay on themselves, I kind of lost my why a little bit. And then when I met my wife, when I was in the Peace Corps, Oh, no kidding. How cool. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the whole another story there. So you uh, both have big hearts. I love it. I love mm-hmm. it. Oh, what a what an awesome place to meet the love of your life. I love it. Well, guys, you can't if you're not if you're listening on iTunes, these babies are behind him on the wall. Maybe that's just one of them. I don't know, but uh just absolutely beautiful. Uh you beautiful family, my friend. You Thank are you. blessed. Yeah. And so the name of your company is Tuzi Capital, T-O-U-Z-I. Is that Tuzi Capital.com or what's the yep. web? Okay. Tuzi Capital.com. And uh um, so, um, yeah, obviously incredibly intelligent guy, um, forgotten more about a spreadsheet than I'll ever know in my lifetime or <laughs> economics. I know you're an economic, uh, by training at Wharton, which is great. By the way, I want to ask you, so you were a two-time poker champion there. Mm-hmm. No kidding. So, so is there, is there a numbers component to it or is it just your ability to have a poker face or just speak to that for a moment before we cut loose? It's almost all number space, mm-hmm. but then when you're in live tournaments, you also have to have a very good read of people. And I mm-hmm. think those two things are, I study behavioral finance. Behavioral mm-hmm. finance is the study of, of incentives and motivations of people and how it can change people's perception of things. And bluffing and betting and doing all that stuff is about changing people's perceptions, whether you representing a card, a hold card or whatever it is. So it's really cool that you can combine both things. Oh, this that is, is awesome. cool. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, listen, my friend, it's very much a pleasure to meet you. And I appreciate you sharing your wisdom and, uh, and humoring me on the senior housing component of what you do. But uh, even though this is a multifamily podcast, but uh, um, thank you. And it was my pleasure to meet you as well. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Rod. I appreciate it. Rod, I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level. Now, I know you've been hard at work helping our warrior students do just that using our ACT methodology, which is awareness, close, and transform. Can you explain to the listeners how they can get our help? You bet. Guys, we've been going nonstop for three years, building an amazing community of like-minded people. And our coaching students, which we call our warriors, have had extraordinary results. They've purchased thousands and thousands of units. And last year, we did over a thousand units with our students. And we're looking to grow this group and take it to the next level. We're looking for people who want to follow a proven framework that's really step-by-step and then leverage our systems and network to raise equity, to find and close deals, and to build partnerships nationwide. Now, our warrior community is finding success in any market cycle. So, if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become more of our incredible network and take advantage of the incredible opportunities that are coming very soon, apply to work with us at mentorwithrod.com or text CRUSH to 72345 and we'll set up a call so you can check us out and we can check you out. That's mentorwithrod.com or text CRUSH to 72345.